Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Actually, today's one I really hope you're going to be watching rather than listening to because I'm here with sculptor Benjamin Pachurik and his sculptures. I feel like I, I've got a whole little family around me here that absolutely it's really pretty wonderful. Thank you for bringing them and, and welcome. And thanks for having me. We originally learned about you because you, you got a little bit famous there for one of those sculptures that went into the Portland Museum of Art. Right. Let's let's start with a little conversation about that. Yeah, that sculpture is titled Floralung. It was intended to be a entry piece for the Title Shift Award, which was a climate change themed art exhibit for for youth artists like myself to create art pieces of any medium representing in some way or another climate change or climate change impacts. And I chose to utilize kind of my personal art style of like incorporating wood and metal um, and making it personal to me and also this kind of unique idea of what like a post-climate change world would look like. You know, that that did fairly well with the Pro and Press Herald and also with the with the title shift award. Well, what's notable about this sculpture is that it also incorporates this this living thing, this this air plant, technically, right. I guess. But there's a real meaning behind that for you. For sure. The um it's it's the first time I've ever incorporated something alive into my onto my art. Most of the stuff is like wood, which I guess you can call live, but it's, it's cut wood and just cold metal. And it was this this kind of element of vulnerability or softness that I don't often incorporate into my work. Um, and I, I use the air plants for that. And it was this this idea that the air being withdrawn from the air plants is sustaining this life, this this figure that I that I represented. And also using that opportunity, that, that extra life that he's receiving from the plant, he's taking that energy to foster younger plants and, and potentially sustain himself in the future. And it's, it's that kind of hopeful yet kind of terrible um, circumstance that he's in that, that um, a lot of people find pretty powerful and, and moving. His posture uh, reminds me of the thinker. It, um, right. And did you have that in mind or... Most of my stuff kind of has that arched back kind of focused, like either like like uh, protecting or just solely isolated on some some circumstance, so that his posture necessarily like he's regarding it very intimately and closely, but he's also huddling it in in this in this manner that kind of protecting it from the outside. And just giving that his 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 life depends on the life of those plants. That kind of incorporating that element into it was uh, my goal. Yeah, you're describing something that's r really common and really human. Right. And in the work I do as a doctor, when people come in and they tell me they have neck and back pain, it's often you know they just it's yes it could be just that they're looking at their phone or their computer all day long. Sure. But but also there is some element of kind of protecting their heart and protecting that that vulnerable side of themselves. And, and what you're describing really is a pretty significant vulnerability. Absolutely, yeah. And in, 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 in a way, that is his heart, that is his, his existence, is that, that planter that, he, that he's holding in his lap. And I, I just hope to kind of represent that, the, this, the fundamental, you know, like necessity of its existence, because without it, the figure representing humanity would not exist. So I'm glad that that uh, got across. You also have this piece that um, where somebody is leaning over looking at a flower and it's not a living flower, but it's obviously it's symbolizing mm -hmm. a flower. And yet there's some sorrow and some pain. Absolutely. In this. Describe this piece for me. So this piece is called Defender. And it was inspired directly from the, the war in Ukraine. I was, I was watching the, the news coverage of the, the, the bombing of Snake Island when that first happened. And my first response was kind of to say, to show my advocacy for Ukraine and, and show my support. And looking around me, I saw 
a bunch of other people doing that same thing. And it, it felt like my voice in the matter, my, my, my stance on the whole issue would be minimalized if it was to be like, say like changing my Instagram bio to like the like glory to Ukraine with the Ukraine flag or something like this. So I decided to do something a little bit more personal, a little bit more individual and create this, this sculpture called Defender um, of a figure representing Ukraine as a, as a whole or as an individual Ukrainian soldier um, given the, the yellow armband protecting the sunflower, which is the national flower of Ukraine. And he's supporting himself with his right hand on a pile of rubble that, or, or just destruction that the Russians have um, brought over to, to Ukraine. And on his back are these little plates of armor that have been severely warped and kind of destroyed one of them's by his feet, having fallen off. And it's showing his, again, that, that same posture of like protection and just nurturing um, in a way towards this this um this flower representing like the the entity and the message of Ukraine at the moment. It also for me it evokes hope and a sense that if he's able to defend and he's able to protect, then there is a possibility for the future. Absolutely. And with every project I make, something new, I always I always incorporate a new element into this. And this for this one it was color. Um I, I've never painted any I'm not I'm not a painter. I, I don't do a lot of um like colorful things a lot of it's just brown and, and silver or just kind of monotone but this vibrant yellow like in the in the center of the the sculpture does give off that sense of like light and and hopefulness and it's uh it's, it's really nice seeing that like and you can you can also see it as like oh this is so sad like look at this person like literally destroying himself to to protect uh what he what he values and, and holds dear but you can also see like it is a very hopeful and promising um, kind of sculpture. Is it important to be able to maintain some sense of hope as you're working with these very serious and significant topics? I think so, yes. Or you're just going to get really sad working on these these sculptures. But um, with this one in particular, like I'm very hopeful that, that Ukraine will in some way or another prevail and either be like recognized always as Ukraine and, or having, um, or having defeated, defeated the Russians in, in, in the war. But this, this sculpture kind of shows where they are right now as like this, this struggle in this, this kind of, um, this tiredness that I'm, I'm sure many of the, the soldiers and volunteers still in Ukraine are, are facing. Yeah, I think this is something that I often I often think about because my daughter's boyfriend was was in Afghanistan not long before they pulled everybody out. And that was a war that lasted the entirety of his lifetime and my daughter's. Right. And when this first happened in Ukraine, I think it was easy for us to say, "Oh, well, of course this couldn't have happened and it's going to be over soon, but it's already been going on quite a while. Absolutely. And it's so devastating. And the long-term impact, as we saw in Afghanistan, right. is really something we can't even begin to understand. Well, it's definitely a unique stance that we're in right now because we're, we're viewing it as a kind of a third party. Like while we are involved um, in, in some ways in, in the war, we, we are kind of regarding it as more of this, this we, can, we can review it more as, as an outside event, yeah. not necessarily a domestic one. Um, and I think that's pretty dangerous. I, I've I've been seeing less and less news coverage on what's going on in Ukraine while the war continues to rage on. And I understand people get distracted, but there's some things that I believe we need to hone our focus in. And this is this is one of them. Tell me about this other piece. It, it looks as if this in this. I mean, I want, almost said individual because it seems so human to me, but it is right. reaching for something. This was made a while ago. Um, if, for a school project, um, and this was right after we finished our block on African literature at my old school. And the, the book that we were supposed to encapsulate with some sort of project, um, like either an essay or a poem or something, um, was is Nervous Conditions. It's about a young girl's in, living in Africa, her struggle for 
um, kind of getting an education, education equality, and just that that kind of um, opportunity, equality, equality of opportunity. And it was showing this is this is African Coca Bolo, the base. So I, I figured it would be suiting for kind of like a pretty African themed project. And it's showing how this figure representing the girl or in, in the book directly or any kind of anybody facing a similar problem is rooted directly to her roots and her in her circumstance that's disallowing her from reaching for this diploma representing like education, success, things like this and how these existing measures and, and restraints are keeping them back and holding them down. What was the unique element in this piece? It was using paper. Um, and the paper that rep- the, the ribbon wrapped around the diploma, um, that was something that could have gone really bad, could have gone great, but I got it on first or second try. And that was just um, something I haven't replicated because I think it's, I, I like it being individual to this, this, to this piece. Um, but it was also the first time I did a kind of a focused um, figure, like the, the, the figure was the sculpture wasn't necessarily a larger, um, like I've made, I made, I've made other projects that were just a, a big staircase for instance, and there's a little, little guy at the bottom, but the, the sculpture was a staircase. This was kind of the inspiration to start making the figures themselves, the, the piece of art and not necessarily in a, in a accompaniment to the art. And, um, this inspired me to go on and make larger, larger sculptures and, and whatnot. So this was kind of ground zero for me. I spoke with uh, a fellow artist, Matt Barter, Mm -hmm. and I know that you have a relationship with Matt. Right. Um, I love his work. His work is is wood, but he does his own sort of sculpting, but also extremely unique and, and figurative in its own very unique way. What types of things, when you get together with Matt, mm-hmm. is what types of things do you talk about from an artistic standpoint? Right. Most of the time when I talk to Matt about my art, I usually have the art in my hands and I'm walking through the his door to his gallery and he's like, whoa, Ben, that's, that's, that's great. Like, let me know how I can help. And a lot of it's, we just, we, I'll go up to his workshop and he'll, he'll show me some materials he's not using or something that I think would be cool. And, and we'll just, we'll throw ideas back and forth at projects that we're both working on at the time. And, you know, moving up from Florida, Matt was the first person like that my family met. Um, just stop it, stopping by his gallery. And he's been just a total friend and ally ever since then. So we, we like Matt, we like his father, um, Philip, Philip Barter. Um, and they've both been huge inspirations towards my art and my kind of my artistic leaning towards like alternative um, materials and just really everything that, that kind of got me into art. Philip just had his opening last night mm-hmm. at the Portland Art Gallery, and it was really, it, it was truly um, amazing to see the body of work um, that was on display in the room, in the main room. And it just, it struck me that this is somebody who's been doing very unique things for probably all his life. Absolutely. And you're embarking on that journey from this end of mm-hmm. things. Have you learned any particular lessons from working with people who have been doing this a little longer than you? Um, one of the major ones, like with both Matt and Philip, they definitely have their own style of art. And while I don't seek to replicate it because I view it as their own, I think that they've both inspired me to find my own style and stick with it. And I hope that I've done that. Uh, I think that uh, all the pieces I have can be identified as created by the same person just with the way they the way they look just the the mannerisms the the materials used and it was that that more of just becoming an individual artist not necessarily making art but making your art was was what they um they both succeeded to inspire me to do what was it like moving up here from florida it it was exciting um the we didn't do it necessarily. We, we didn't have much. We don't have any family up here. We don't re- really have any friends when we first came up here. So it was just kind of a lifestyle change, like let, let's do it kind of thing. So in Florida, the school I was going to was more sports driven and more, more like less, just didn't really embrace art the way, the way Maine did. And once I got up here, I, I started playing around with 
think it was a hot glue gun. It was in some cardboard. I was like, oh, I can make some cool things with this. And that just really didn't satisfy this, this kind of urge I had to make something permanent and, and kind of profound. So I, I got, I think I bought some sort of um, soldering iron, like something for like computers or something and played around with that a little bit and then eventually jumped to the welder where I taught myself how to weld. And I wouldn't, I would never have gone down that route if I hadn't moved to Maine with that, with this kind of artistic um, pulling. And you ended up starting at one school in Maine and mm-hmm. moving to a different school in Maine. And my understanding is that initially when you started doing your art at the first school, it maybe wasn't as appreciated as perhaps it currently is at the school you're at now. Sure. I mean, I'm at Wayne Fleet right now, and they've been incredibly supportive of everything I've done from the like the title shifts and the, the, the Press Herald interview. And you know, I'm walking down the halls and, and teachers I don't even have classes with will, will compliment my work and say, oh, I just read your article. That's, that's so amazing. And like, I'd love to see some more of your stuff. And just today, as I was leaving, I, I, many teachers were t- wishing me good luck on this interview. I'm not, I don't know how they knew I was going, but they knew. And this, their, their support and their, their kind of advocacy for me has been really, really helpful, especially considering it's my first year and I'm dealing with all the first year stuff along with beginning my junior year. And, um, no, it's been a, an incredibly great experience at Wayne Fleet. Which is not to say that the first school you were at was, you know, it's not to say that that was a negative experience. It just was a different experience, and it sounds like the one that you've moved into is one that fits you better. Yes, absolutely. You live in Freeport, mm-hmm. and the piece that is behind me is one that you've done actually kind of in concert with work that you have been doing for a while with a very well-known organization. Right. Um, the Wolf Snack community is we're pretty close with that um, family wise, but they've re- they reached out to me regarding some of my pieces I've made. I think it was the floor along, which is the one they saw. And they said, we'd love to display and auction off one of your pieces if you would if you'd like to if we'd commission you to make one for us so we can so we can sell it. And I worked on a piece called Pathmaker and just kind of representing Wolf's Neck, Wolf's Neck's alternative um, way of going about agriculture and sustainably um, farming and creating this sculpture using a lot of wire, wood, and just everything else I've, I've used in the past. And right when we were about the day, we were supposed to, to drive it to Wolf's Neck and give it to them to, to auction off. My parents, um, they didn't want to see it go. They kind of fell in love with it at the time. So they they called really they they called up and say hey, we can't we can't um we can't give this to you because we we want to see it in our house. Um, so they've they've had their time with it now and it's going to go back to Wolf's Neck to be displayed um, in the in the near future. It's very nice of your parents to to give up the the, the pathmaker family member. Absolutely, and it'll be hard for them, but I think they'll get over it. Yes. Well, as I've brought up on this show before, one of the benefits of working with artists and having art available to me is that I do a lot of art fostering. So Mm -hmm. the art comes in and and we foster it for a little while. And sometimes I want it to join us forever, but we're not the forever home and we have to let it go to the next forever home. So it's hard, but, but it's good. It's a good process. It is. That's the issue I face often when I, when I make a piece of work, um, not like uncommissioned work, like say, like um, Defender, for instance, like that was made not necessarily for me, but it wasn't made for anybody else. So if I were to give it to somebody, sell it to somebody, it would definitely be more of a hard thing to do, considering how long it's been in my house, how long I've been looking at it, things like that. It's also, a, this represents a tremendous investment of your time and energy and kind of emotional commitment to do these pieces. I mean, they, they literally take hours and hours and hours Mm -hmm. of all of the, all of the above. Right. The it's during the school year, it has been difficult to find the time away from school, like on the weekends to commit to doing art pieces, but I do my best to, to dedicate as much time as possible to, to these projects and get, get as many done as possible and just kind of spread my wings a bit with the time I have. But the summer is is often when I do the most work and I can do the most work consistently and have like a schedule dedicated time to to each one of these projects. I'm I'm interested in your choice of wood and metal because 
it's not an easy, well, wood maybe a little bit more so, but certainly metal having to use a soldering iron and do welding. I mean, right. that that's a pretty big commitment, maybe a little dangerous. It's certainly a lot oh. of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the, the amount of times I've set myself on fire welding and, 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 and like when you, when you start in, in involving wood and metal in welding, which is just extreme heat and electricity forcing its way through metal and can, having wood and sawdust be everywhere, a lot of stuff is often on fire, um, myself included. So it's definitely a dangerous activity to, to engage in, but I think the end goal is pretty awesome. And then for my like choice in materials, I think that most of my stuff in my, just my collection of work incorporates some level of vulnerability as we were talking about before. And in that it could be really easy to create something say, out of clay and, and represent vulnerability, but it's, I, I view it as more difficult to take a piece of metal, some familiar and just really uh, like cold material and shaping it and welding it into the, into a shape that we can all view as kind of objectively like not pitiful for instance. And that, that kind of emotional response and that the thought that goes into the viewer looking at my, at my work, um, it's definitely gratifying. You're a junior in high school now mm -hmm. at a new school. You've gotten a lot of um, well-deserved attention for the pieces that you've done. It seems like um, you're, you definitely are moving in a direction that's really consistent with the artists that you probably always have been and, and, and want to continue to be. Do you have a sense of what your future looks like in this area? I want to incorporate either art or welding into anything I do um, in the future. I'm also really invested in politics, current events, and things like this. So art college is definitely on the table, but I might go lean towards something more within the political realm. Um, in my free time, I'm also uh, getting my pilot's license fairly soon. So like some sort of military engineer would also be an ab in a totally acceptable um, job for me. But you know, I, I, I love welding. I love creating. So I think incorporating elements like welding or woodworking into into my my career in the future will uh, serve me well. I, I believe I understood at one point you and maybe and hopefully still do you were interested in going to one of the military academies. Mm -hmm. So I have a brother and a sister who both went to the Air Force Academy. So okay. I may have to put in a plug for the Air Force Academy, considering you have this this pilot background. But also, I would tell you what's interesting. I really felt um, in learning this about you. I thought of my brother Jeff, who is still in the Air Force, but he was a fine artist when he was in high school, and he went on to become a pilot and then a doctor, and now he's a surgeon in the Air Force. But I think that the visual sense that he had as an artist, he's probably maintained that and applied it in really different and interesting ways throughout his career. Yeah, absolutely. Like when I when I fly, there's definitely an element of like memorization and finesse and technique that goes into it, and I can absolutely imagine that that translates very easily into like being a surgeon or or even flying flying a jet plane or something like this. Um, but no, the military academies have definitely been appealing. And just, you know, representing America, serving America, just things I've always been passionate about. It's also interesting to me to think about kind of this, this very distinct, um, these pieces, they're very solid, they're very grounding. I mean, there is some flexibility to them in the way that they're created. But when you fly... There's, it's very air and mm -hmm. you're in the sky and yes, there's a technical aspect of things, but I know having spoken to artist, um, Eric Hopkins, who also has experience with flight and incorporates air into, and flight into his pieces, that's, that's very different than the sort of the energetic feeling of the pieces that I'm seeing around me. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense that it, you may at some point in the future incorporate more, more air, more light into your work? I think that when viewing the, the final product of like my work and just seeing the sculpture piece like at its at its end, it can seem very solidified and, and just absolute.
but when I'm when I'm working on it in the garage, there's definitely that that light, airy feeling that you're you're talking about, like when it comes to flying. Um, just I'll put my welding helmet on, put some music on, and zone out, and I'll I'll come out of it two hours later and say, "Wow, it's a lot of progress I've made." Um, so there's definitely this element of freedom and just and lightness that goes into creating these things while there's also a, a large risk that I also has to be taken into consideration when listening to music and totally zoning out while welding. But I, I do my best to, to balance the two. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in both cases, I can see being a pilot where you're up in the air and there's an amount, it's an element of danger to that. Right. Here you are setting wood potentially on fire while you're working on metal. There's a little bit of danger to that. And also there's a lot of energy around mm. both of these processes. And and even as we're talking, yes, the, the elements of the pieces, the wood and the metal are very grounding, but the sense of them, there is a, a sense of lightness and there is a sense, even as I'm looking at them, that that they're more than, um, they're not as tethered as, as other metal pieces, metal sculpture that I've seen in the past. Sure. Uh, and with... With my work, I always try to, with my newer pieces, I've always tried to create some element or some illusion of functionality with, with my work. Whether that be adding like a cog at a, on a joint or creating some sort of spring mechanism that would look like it would, it would allow for movement. And while everything is completely welded so it doesn't rattle around or, or make noise, everything's bolted together, I try to create some sort of, yeah, like an, an illusion that this could stand up and walk away. Um, and I, I'm doing. I've been experimenting more and more with these kind of these kind of um, elements that I'm that I'm talking about. Oh yeah, there's there's no doubt in my mind that um, if we were to leave the room and close the door behind us, right. that these these ones would be. I, I say these guys, but I don't really know that there's a gender specifically assigned to them. But I, I have a strong sense that they'd be up dancing around. Hopefully, I, I don't know. I've never seen them get up, but you know, they they might. Anything's possible. Absolutely. Well, Benjamin, I have very much enjoyed this conversation. Me too. And I hope that I will have a chance to continue to see your work and reconnect within the artistic community. And um, thanks for taking the time to come in and talk to me today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I've been speaking with sculptor Benjamin Pachurik, and I know we're going to actually see quite a bit of this individual in the future. He really does have wonderful sculptures. Uh, I can extre- I can absolutely understand why his family does not want to let go of them. But but those of you who are interested can can engage in the auctioneering process and maybe have one for your own. I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you've been listening to or watching Radio Maine.